Good evening and welcome to ITV News Meridian. Tonight's headlines here in the south. Empty stations, commuters stay at home as the southern rail strikes go from bad to worse. Tonight, three Sussex bishops call for an end to the misery. How where you live can affect how long you wait for cataract surgery. The hospital super laser that could help with quicker treatment. A new FA inquiry, the latest to Southampton Football Club and others are investigated for historical child abuse. And stars that fell like the rain. And the soundtrack of their lives, how dementia patients are being helped by their own personal playlists. Good evening. Faced with cancelled trains and bus replacements, it seems many Southern Rail commuters simply gave up attempting to travel. It's day one of the latest three-day strike. After seven months of industrial action and in an extraordinary move, three Sussex bishops call for an end to what they call the circle of blame between rail bosses and unions. Around half of services aren't running. There are no Southern trains from Southampton and Portsmouth with replacement buses from from Havant to Chichester. There is a reduced service across the network to Brighton, up to Gatwick and into London Bridge and London Victoria. After seeing trains reinstated at the end of September, replacement buses have returned to and from Seaford. And with train drivers due to stage their own industrial action next week, it is set to get even worse, as Malcolm Shaw now reports. <laughs> rush hour at Brighton station this morning and the concourse was unusually quiet. With only half of southern services running normally, it seems many commuters simply stayed away. Outside, the RMT picket line was smaller than on previous strike days, but the guards' opposition to driver-only trains as strong as ever. Ultimately, what we're trying to achieve is maintaining a safe railway, and that's what it's always been about for us. And we know that if we keep a second person on the train who understands about operational safety and passenger safety, then the railways overall are a safer place to travel. But with the dispute dragging on month after month, some passengers are now reaching the end of their tether. Everybody is sick of it. We're all hardworking. We just want to get to work. And these guys, the unions, all they want to do is hold on to their little bit of power they actually have. Alex Hemmonsley from Hove is a freelance writer who frequently needs to travel to London. The shoddy service on Southern has cost her thousands in lost work. She believes the root of the problem lies in the rail company's unusual contract with the Department for Transport. They hire Southern, they pay them a salary, a set fee, which leaves us as the commuters with absolutely no choice. We've got no recompense. If we, if we all decide to not turn up one day, they'll still get paid the same. With no talks planned between Southern and the unions, many are calling on the government to step in. This is a dispute between the train company and the union, uh, and I don't think I should insert myself into those negotiations. If they call off the strikes, I'll sit down and talk to them about how we can work together in the future the, for, for the future of the passenger and for the rail industry. The government needs to step in and Chris make Chris Grayling has told us today he won't do that. No, and he, you know, I've just come from a meeting uh, seeing him today, and he's made it clear this is a dispute between Southern Rail and uh, the unions. But you know, I think that it's the government's role that when that's not being resolved, um, to step in. The disruption is set to increase dramatically this time next week when the train drivers union as left begins the first of nine days of strikes. That could bring southern services to a standstill. There's every chance this dispute will drag on into the new year. Tonight, three Sussex bishops urged someone to lead the way and end what they call the circle of blame. Malcolm Shaw, ITV News, Brighton. Southern Rail's parent company is Govia Thameslink Railway. We can speak to its Deputy Chief Operating Officer, Alex Folds. Mr Folds, thanks for talking to us. Now, firstly, this is a ludicrous situation for passengers and marks the end of an awful year and now a Christmas of chaos. Guards out on strike this week. Next week, it's drivers. How can you let this happen? Well, it is a very, very frustrating situation and I'd like to apologise for all our customers for the, uh, the service that they've, uh, they've enjoyed over the last few months. 
we believe that we have a very reasonable proposition that we've put to uh, our trade unions about the improvements we want to make to our service, which are all focused on making our, our customer service better. It's so frustrating for passengers, though. I mean, the Transport Secretary, Chris Grayling, has said he won't intervene. You've already been hauled before MPs to explain your poor service. So why is it so difficult to get a mature compromise? Well, we have been trying to compromise. We've put proposals to the RMT, our so-called eight-point plan, uh, which they failed to put to their members. So, you know, there has been an element of compromise, and we really would ask the RMT to work with us more closely um, to allow us to make these changes that we need to make. But the unions have said that you haven't asked them to return to the negotiating table. Um, well, you know, it's, it's a very different uh, perspective from the one I would put on things, and I would say that we have tried very, very hard um, to talk to the, to the RMT. The RMT have certain things that they will not budge on, um, and we think we've made a very reasonable proposition which is based on, as I say, improving the service we offer to our customers, less cancellations and long-term job security for their members. And briefly, Bishops in Sussex pleading for an end to this dispute, to recognise the disruption and passenger safety concerns. It's a question we've asked you so many times, but what will it take to end this? Well, in terms of passenger safety, there are no concerns about this, uh, the safe operation of the railway. This is a system that we're proposing to uh, introduce. It's not new. It's something that already exists on large parts of our network and large parts of the, of the national network. It's a system that the regulators who regulate this business have agreed is safe. So there's no question of safety. So there, there is are, no you resolution. Will know some... What's the, how will we resolve this? Well, I think we need to resolve it um, by the RMT and ASLEF recognising that the changes we want to make are better for our customers, getting behind us in that desire to improve the service to our customers um, and supporting us in the changes we want to make. Alex Folds, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. In other news, the family of a woman whose body was found in Woodland in Hampshire have thanked search teams. Isabel Munro went missing in April. Her remains were found in Barton-on-Sea last Tuesday. Her death is not being treated as suspicious. A man who stole a number of poppy collection boxes from shops across Dorset in the New Forest has been jailed for 18 weeks. 49-year-old Philip Allen pleaded guilty to eight counts of theft. A van has crashed into a car showroom near Arundel, causing it to partly collapse. It hit a stationary car before crashing into the building at Hammerpot Hill. The van driver was only slightly injured. A hospital in the south has become one of the first NHS centres to use lasers as its first-line treatment for cataracts. Well, where you live depends on how long you'll have to wait for cataract treatment. And the Dorset County Hospital patients wait around 160 days from their first appointment through to surgery. At the Royal Hampshire County Hospital in Winchester, the waiting time is up to 119 days. And at the Sussex Eye Hospital in Brighton, it's around 168 days from GP referral referral to treatment that's 24 weeks well it's hoped new laser technology at the Frimley Park Hospital in Surrey will bring down waiting times as Penny Sylvester now explains Ken Taylor is back at Frimley Park Hospital he's recovering from a stroke and then four weeks ago he had the cataract operation that changed his life when you get your eyesight back it helps your balance it helps your clarity of viewing it helps your walking it helps your balance and it helps everything concentrate with stroke it brings it back on the eyes another patient is about to have surgery cataracts are the most common cause of vision loss especially as we get older a cataract is a cloudy lens inside the eye and we have to get at that cloudy material to take it out and before the laser we would manually tear open the lens capsule and then fragment the cloudy lens into pieces and suck that out and what the laser does is cut a perfectly circular opening to the lens capsule so that we don't have to do that and it divides the lens into fragments ready to be sucked out. The laser is just one part of cataract surgery but it's having its impact on NHS waiting lists. Around 3,000 cataract operations are carried out here at Frimley Park every year and of those 80% are now being done with this new laser treatment. That means more patients can be seen and the waiting lists are getting shorter. Why this lends itself so well to the NHS is because we work in teams in the NHS. There's not just one surgeon in a private hospital. This is a team of surgeons and so I can have my registrar doing the laser and feeding patients down to me in the operating theatre. That makes me very, very efficient because I'm utilised my time. 
and there's no underestimating the effect of an operation that helps restore your sight. Unbelievable. <laughs> it is really um, life-changing, it really is good. The future of cataract surgery on the NHS. Penny Sylvester, ITV News, Frimley. A wildlife artist from Dorset who used a car showroom as studio space for a 15-foot painting of an elephant has just finished his work. It took Jonathan Trust five weeks to paint the huge portrait, which he hopes will highlight the plight of these endangered animals. The car dealership in Poole was the only place he could fit this giant canvas. It'll now be auctioned with some proceeds going to charity. This is by far the most difficult painting I've ever had to do. Uh, to, to be so close to the painting the whole time is very, very difficult to work, uh, to work like that, um, up and down the country the whole time. And trying to, trying to get it, the composition to work actually was really, really hard. Yeah, I'm really pleased with the elephant. I think it's worked out well. It's evolved a lot since I started uh, five weeks ago, but we finally got there. Great to see it finished. You're watching ITV News in the Meridian Region coming up. Postcards, love letters and Christmas cards, the personal stories we've mailed over the centuries. And for more on all of our stories, you can head to itv.com forward slash Meridian. Call us on 0808 1010 095 or get in touch via Facebook or send us a tweet at ITV Meridian. Well, each day brings sadly more allegations of historical child abuse in football. This evening, a total of six former Southampton youth players have now come forward with a series of claims dating from the 1980s and 1990s. This week, former football coach Bob Higgins was named as part of those allegations. He denies any wrongdoing, although at the time there were warnings made to clubs about working with his soccer academy. Hampshire Police is now investigating and the FA itself has launched an inquiry. But today, a journalist who reported on the abuse allegation 20 years ago says she is not surprised it's taken this long for the authorities to take action. Richard Slee has our report. He was a grown man playing psychological games with a young lad. The way he did things and uh, the things that he did were, were wrong. To be doing that with young kids is wrong. Former Southampton player Dean Radford was one of many young men who blew the whistle on Bob Higgins 20 years ago. The presenter of the Channel 4 Dispatches programme says she had hoped her revelations would lead to changes in the way young players were treated, but nothing happened. I was horrified, but I wasn't surprised because I could see the reaction from the FA. I knew the reaction from the clubs that we'd spoken to. They just didn't want to know. It's not as if the footballing authorities didn't already know what was being said about Bob Higgins. In 1989, the Football League sent a letter to all its clubs with a warning. And today, the former Saints manager Harry Redknapp said the rumours that Bob Higgins may have abused young players in the 1980s had been rife for years. One of Dean Radford's young teammates at Southampton was Alan Shearer, who today received his CBE at Buckingham Palace. He says he wasn't affected by the allegations against Bob Higgins, but paid tribute to those who have come forward to expose the abuse. The more people that can do that, then the better it will be for everyone and for kids in the future. So um, really honest of them, really brave of them. And in doing so, I'm pretty sure that they're helping a lot of people in doing that. Yesterday, Southampton said it was working with the police to investigate the allegations against Bob Higgins. And today, the FA announced it's investigating the way it handled similar allegations going back 35 years. At Bournemouth, the club is telling concerned parents that the game today is a safe place for youngsters. I can't talk about the past, understandably, but what I can reassure them is the future. Uh, they could not be in a safer, happier environment than they are at our football club. Six former Southampton youth players have now come forward with allegations about Bob Higgins. We have tried to contact him for a response, but Mr Higgins has not been available. He has always denied any wrongdoing. Richard Slee, ITV News. 
It's said to be the longest standing commercial sponsorship in sport, but last month's Hennessy Gold Cup was the last to bear the cognac company's name. Yes, Hennessy is pulling out of its deal with Newbury Racecourse after 60 years of backing the famous event. The racecourse said it is fitting the contract was ending after such a thrilling race won by Native River. It's not yet known who will take over the sponsorship. Now, music has long been associated with helping people with dementia and one charity is helping put together personalised playlists for those with the condition. Yes, carers across our region say Playlist for Life shows how music can help nursing home residents. James Crichton-Smith has more. Dillis has never played music to her mum Nancy before. She has advanced dementia. Nancy used to be a dancer. What did you do to this? Quick step? Oh, no, you look Spanish eyes was the tango, says Nancy. It's a detail Dillis didn't know about her mother before listening to this music together. And it's moments like this that one charity is aiming to encourage across the UK. For the first time, these carers are finding out about Playlist for Life, the idea that music from people's pasts, put together on an MP3 player and listened to, can help them through times of distress when living with dementia. Why wait for December to offer someone their favourite carols? These can bring delight at any time. Very early in our lives, we're able to pick up on music. Before we're even born, in fact, we're imprinted with music. And that music, because it very often has those autobiographical memories, means that that music is very useful and it stays with us right to the point where we actually die. For those working with care home residents, there's no surprise that music can have such a big impact. It's absolutely brilliant. It, it, you feel that you're doing a job that, that you should be doing and that's the reason really that we're here that we want to enhance the lives of our people who are living with dementia and through music it's families who can glimpse their loved ones as they once were before dementia I took her on holiday about four years ago and the coach driver put some music on which was war songs and um, she found them quite depressing because she was a teenager in the war and she said oh can't you put something on that? it's only 50 years old so I had to talk to the coach driver and uh, he put the Rolling Stones on and it was amazing how many people in their 80s were nodding away to brown sugar and jumping Jack Flash. <laughs> so um, she does like 60s music as well, quite a broad spectrum. This is how music can bring loved ones and pasts together in the present. James Crichton-Smith, ITV News. The curse of dementia and one way of combating it. Now, we all have a stash of old letters somewhere hidden up in the loft or tucked away in a drawer. I've got some lovely ones from my granddad. Have you? Yeah, and he passed away a few years ago, so there I love are. reading them. There you are. Well, earlier this year, the Royal Mail appealed for people to share theirs in its Letter of Our Lives campaign and has been inundated with everything from wartime letters to Christmas cards. Yeah, they've been sent in from all over the UK with some very interesting ones from here in the south, including Portsmouth and Oxford. The collection has now been put online to celebrate the Royal Mail's 500th anniversary and Lauren Hall's been looking at some of the highlights. Just a few lines to let you know I'm keeping well. We are still at base yet, which is only 40 miles off the firing line. I beg most earnestly to make you an offer of my hand and heart. Owing to circumstances, I am forced to apply to everybody I know abroad. It is most urgent. We've been writing to each other for centuries. Now, some of the best examples are being showcased by the Royal Mail as part of its Letters of Our Lives campaign. It was an appeal to the nation to say, go into your lofts, go into the drawers, find that old tin where you've stored all those letters from yesteryear, dig them out, dust them off and send them to us. And we've been inundated. Some of the letters reflect major events in history. 
quite a few sent by those serving in the First World War. This is a particularly poignant uh, letter written from the Somme, from the trenches and carried by pigeon service. And not only did it get there, we have it in our hands a hundred years later. Other letters capture the events of the Second World War. This sent by a Jewish woman living in Germany to her friend in the UK. She's writing to everybody she knows abroad, saying that things are getting very urgent now and that a friend of hers is in a concentration camp already. We don't know whether that lady did survive. All we know from the letter is just how desperate that woman was, trying to get help, trying to get out of Germany. A number of letters are from our region. Among them is one sent to a lady in Winchester following the Titanic disaster. This is a really interesting one. It's a postcard sent to a lady who lost her fiancé and her brother on the Titanic. This was produced in memoriam. And my understanding is that the lady who received it took a very dim view of what she thought was really sort of profiteering on a very tragic event. The collection also marks happier occasions. This letter is a proposal of marriage submitted by a lady from Oxford. Others offer pearls of wisdom. In the 1800s, a father writes to his son in Portsmouth to advise against drinking to excess. Let me caution you against drinking, but in moderation. A more recent example is some advice from a boy's grandfather. Don't try to be a man by smoking. It's hard on your pocket, it's unhealthy and knocks years off your life. Every single one of those letters was special to somebody uh, and uh, I think each is, is part of a treasure trove. And we've been just delighted with the variety and uh, how much of a, a light they've shone on to different aspects of history through the ages. The collection's now online and even includes a few Christmas cards. Here's one sent from a family in the UK to another in Australia. This is our favourite, they say. You can send it back to us next Christmas. They've exchanged the same card ever since for nearly 70 years. In fact, many of us will be writing to each other this Christmas. We may not often put pen to paper, but it's clear the tradition lives on during the festive season. Lauren Hall, ITV News. Same Lovely. card every year for seven. What a good idea. Oh, yeah, what a good idea. <laughs> no, yeah, recycling yes. as well. Very good. Now, here's a man who likes fan mail. It's Simon. I thought you meant who likes recycling other stuff. <laughs> which no, is, I know you know, you. I've, I've made a career out of it, to be honest. But uh, yes, um, email is my preferred communication route. Yes. And um, we've had some interesting <laughs> pictures. Very cold weather, obviously, coming to an end soon. You'll be pleased to know. Yes. But uh, look at that lovely picture of uh, John Cuthbert's birdhouse. Yes. But look at the top lug. Oh, Have you ever seen oh. one of those before? What is frosty it? bubble? Hey. Oh, um, makes me want to take up fortune telling, I think, or, <laughs> or predicting the future. Yeah, speaking of which, uh, here's an early spring rose in Patsy Crouch's garden. She says that the rose bush is still covered in buds, but it doesn't seem to mind the recent frosty conditions. It's global lovely. warming. It, it, do, you think, do you think that's what it is? You being an expert and all. <laughs> I just think and, it's a nice um, picture. Look what's happening here in <laughs> Sheila Massey's garden. What's that's her, her sweet pea still flowering, look. And yes. that there what is, is actual passion fruit no. really? still on the go. And if you think that's good, yeah. get a load of this. Growing in Peter Brown's tree in Burgess Hill, they are kiwi fruit. No. Oh. Now, I didn't even know you could grow them in this country, let alone in, in December. Burgess so Hill. I checked with the uh, <laughs> Royal Horticultural Society. Yep. Apparently, they grow very well in a sunny, shaded garden, which kind of is a bit of a confusing one. You anyway. learn something every day, don't you? You do. That's what and I'm you, here for. You are a sort of fortune teller because you tell us what the weather's going to be. And here he is now with tonight's forecast, Simon Parkin. From blizzards to pool, driving through Europe. Eurotunnel the Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. Well, for some of us, it was a very gloomy day today. An awful lot of mist and fog to wake up to that didn't bother to budge. Uh, this was Upper Basildon, first thing from Gary Denton and Langston this morning. Well, it looked quite pretty with the mist around, but as I say, stayed generally grey across much of the region. Things will change as we head through the next 24 hours. You can see the isobars tighten, so a bit more wind tomorrow means there's more chance of stirring things up. And then this weather front is going to push its way eastwards through Thursday, so we'll see a bit more clarity and also a little bit of rain too but nothing too major mostly light and patchy but for tonight it's the gloom that's returning the mist and fog not quite so widespread and dense as last night but still making for a grey and grubby night and temperatures tonight well they're very mild uh, up into double figures down towards the coast seven or eight inland so certainly warmer than it was by day 
this time last week. Now, as we start tomorrow again, it's going to be a grey start, but the mist will lift. There'll be a fair bit of cloud too, but as I say, that wind is stronger tomorrow. Uh, probably gusts of around 15, 20 miles an hour along the coast around the Isle of Wight. That's going to stir up the cloud. That's going to cause a few bright spells to develop, so should be a slightly nicer day. Still a fair bit of cloud around, but look at those mild temperatures, 11, 12 degrees. That's very good going for this point in early December. As for your high tide times, well, you can see on the Isle of Wight around 3.15 in the morning, then half three come the afternoon. And then for the next few days, well, Thursday is the day that we got that front coming through. So whilst the temperatures are exceptionally mild, we will see some rain at times. Once that's cleared, we're dry though for Friday. Eurotunnel the Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. In just a moment, we've got the ITV Evening News with Mary Nightingale and James Mates. I shall have our late news, so do try and join me if you possibly can. But for now, from the team here at ITV Meridian, thank you very much indeed for your time and your company. Thank you for watching. Join us again very soon. Until then, from all of us here, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.